You ever think the world needed more unicorns, pancakes, and positive black representation? Well, so did these guys. New Day! The New Day is a team that many, including myself, couldn't ever imagine lasting more than a year past their debut, who ended up being a historic staple in WWE's tag division. As of this recording, this is the New Day's 10th year being a tag team. They've outlasted every team that they've ever feuded against, including ones we thought may never split. And to this day, there are still fans who don't want to see these guys break up. Between the three of them, we have two former world champions, a former king of the ring, and 12-time WWE World Tag Team Champion! What's up guys, it's Kaze here. If you're a fan of wrestling or wrestling content, consider subscribing, as this channel focuses on wrestling both in and outside the ring. The New Day have always been one of my favorite groups, and growing up as a pretty nerdy but still funny black kid, I always found them to be very relatable. This year marks the 10th year that the New Day have been a tag team, and I wanted to take a look back at all the insane moments that they've given us over the past decade. And without further ado, let's get into it. Hoo! Before the New Day debuted, they had video packages airing from week to week, and these promos were very weird for me to watch back. On one hand, the overall vibe is what the New Day would end up becoming, however, the actual subject of the promos couldn't be more off. The three started off with a super cartoony and pretty stereotypical gospel gimmick, one that really should have been dead on arrival, but I really believe the fact that Kofi Kingston was a part of the group, who at the time was solidified in the mid card, gave them a lot of credibility especially because this is the first time we saw him outside his usual gimmick at the time. Now the initial idea was because Big E comes from a father who's a pastor, so him being a person who grew up in the church and even practicing preaching, this is something he was already comfortable with and allowed him to be even more comfortable on the mic in WWE. Now when I was younger I would go to sleep to wrestling podcasts and I remember the New Day being on an episode of Talk is Jericho, and in that episode Xavier Woods stated, rather than being this group that everyone thought it was going to be just like three angry black Black guys it's three guys who have come up from kind of the same background that just want more from life WWE historically has been pretty offensive with their representation of black characters he didn't want them to be mute characters and he didn't want them to be street thugs he wanted to portray black males with a more positive outlook on life and thus we got the power of positivity each member of the group had specific promos dedicated to their characters Kofi jumps into the shot, immediately letting us know he's the high flyer of the group. Big E's promo is an early rendition of a lot of his catchphrases we would go on to hear over the years. Feel the power of the new thing. And Xavier Woods is doing the mess around. Letting us know he's the showman of the group. The New Day debuted on November 28th, 2014. It was a pretty good debut, I mean it was against Curtis Axel, Heath Slater, and Titus O'Neil, so you kinda already know how that goes. But after their match, they were called out by these two weirdos. Welcome to the black hole. Anybody else think he was gonna say something crazy? So the New Day's first official feud was against Stardust and Goldust. And for a bit more context, the tag team champions at the time were The Miz and Miz Dow. Bray Wyatt and Dean Ambrose's majorly disappointing feud was heading into TLC. Seth Rollins and The Authority was running rampant all throughout WWE. I needed a five disc fusion and shoulder replacement. I've had 20 stem cell procedures. And Rusev was an unbeatable, undeniable threat amongst the mid card. After the Cosmic Road Brothers caused them a shot at the WWE Tag Team Championships, The New Day went on SmackDown and cut their first promo. You dirty, nasty looking, face paint wearing! And again, it was shades of what they would go on to be, but you can tell they hadn't found their footing yet. It's very influenced by Gospel Sermon, which was pretty funny, but it's hard to talk trash when you're in the tone of praising the Lord. What you don't seem to understand, I said what you are not getting through your skull. However, their early backstage promos that weren't aired on TV was where their personality shined the most. And it's possible they were doing this for practice, but also to show upper management what they would be like if they weren't so heavily scripted. Their match against the Rhodes Brothers was on the pre-show of TLC. It was a pretty solid, unofficial pay-per-view debut. I'd rate it 2 out of 5 Don Cheadles. And one thing I love about New Day matches is they always add something creative to their tag team moves, the Unicorn Stampede being one of my favorite moves. Their feud with Stardust and Goldust continued to play out on TV. Wait. 
gotcha, bitch. I thought he looked familiar. Do they just pay people to react properly on camera to whatever's going on in the ring? Oh man. Wait, did that Miz girl get a check? On the February 9th, 2015 episode of Raw, it was during a match with the New Day that Stardust walked out on Goldust and then attacked him backstage for calling him Cody. Call me that name again! Cody is dead! They then went on to have a pretty lackluster feud in WWE, which led to AEW's first five-star match, according to Dave Meltzer. But I mean, if it's not the Cheetle meter, does it even matter? The New Day went on to face teams like The Usos, Tyson Kidd and Cesaro, a team I completely forgot about but always loved, and the Los Matadores. Los Carnales is just the Carnales. Los means... Fuck it. Okay, okay. Los Matadores. This culminated in a fatal four-way tag team championship match on the kickoff show at WrestleMania 31, as tag team wrestling was rarely a priority for Vince when it came to booking. Tyson Kidd and Cesaro would end up winning and retaining their championships that they won from the Usos at Fastlane. This was a team that individually the fans wanted more from, so WWE's logical solution was to just put them together. It was during this time that the New Day started to get the most crowd hate, they started leaning into the crowd hate and began to cut more sarcastically positive promos. There's the audience chanting, New Day sucks. It hurts, Renee. But we promise you will not find disappointment in our dancing. Even poking fun at the crowd while doing so. And a kid came up to me and said, <coughs> Mr. E, that New Day thing is terrible. They beat the Lucha Dragons in a number one contenders match and used heel tactics to do so, setting up a match at Extreme Rules with Kid and Cesaro. They also got an RKO for their trouble. Yeah, this was the night Randy Orton was RKOing everybody in sight until he got his hands on Seth Rollins. My friend's mom even got RKO'd. They had a regular tag team match against Kid and Cesaro at Extreme Rules. And am I the only one who hates when they do that? Why are we having normal tag team matches at pay-per-views like Extreme Rules? Anyway, it was a really good match. 3 out of 5 Don Cheadles. In this match, the New Day won their first tag team championships. All of them to be considered champion due to the Freebird rule. And winning the tag team titles really brought new life into the tag team division. Don't get me wrong, the tag teams were pretty solid in the ring. However, they were all not the best at promos. Good, good lucha, lucha thing. If I'm being nice. Even the Usos struggled on the mic back then. By the way, I think I deserve a like for sitting through hours of JBL commentary. Maybe even a sub. Matter of fact, give me your wallet. So in comes the New Day, who's breaking the fourth wall. Hey, this is me saying this, not my character. Country music, sub. Making pop culture references. Hey, we want some ballet. All while maintaining heel heat and holding their own in the ring. They went on to be 50-50 booked against a few tag teams over the next few weeks. You know how it was back then. It was more 50-50s than Donovan Mitchell and Jamal Murray in the bubble. However, the primetime players entered the chat and beat the New Day for the tag team titles at Money in the Bank, thus ending the New Day's first run with the tag team titles. Oh, boo. Okay, okay, until a few weeks later, when they won them back at SummerSlam in a fatal four-way tag team match. You're still getting booed. Oh. This second title reign was the longest in WWE history, until, you know, everything changed when the Bloodline Nation attacked. And over the following months, they would face teams like the primetime players, the Lucha Dragons, and the Los Matadores. Fuck it. It was over this title reign that the New Day officially stopped giving a fuck and started having fun. And for weeks, maybe even months, the New Day became the reason to watch Monday Night Raw. Just to see what off the wall thing that they were gonna say or do. Their most notable feud around this time was with the Usos, mostly because it led to this promo between the New Day and The Rock. On your cousins, the Usos! You call yourself the people's champion, but I'm looking at you and I don't see any gold. Where that Where's though? Your gold? Where that though? Where that though? Like, team, cheer! A promo that, in my opinion, really solidified their skills on a mic. They've always been some of the few talents on the roster who weren't heavily scripted. They began a feud in the summer of 2016 with the Wyatts. And this was one of the most intriguing and underrated storylines of their entire run as a tag team. It started off with the New Day being the New Day, dressing up as the Wyatts and cutting hilarious promos on them. Oh, 
However, throughout the feud, Xavier Woods started to be more and more mesmerized by Bray Wyatt's promos. It's a new day, yes it is! It grew to a point where he was actually afraid of Bray Wyatt. Well, what about you, Xavier? Because it seems to me like you're a bit shook. Woods essentially became that guy in the group where everyone else is down to fight and he's just like, I don't know, let's not make him too angry. And I really like how Bray's character was used at the time. He was actually portrayed as a big threat, Xavier Woods being the loudmouth showman of the group. Booty! <laughs> was starting to become more distant and quiet, a complete 180 of what he usually is. The two teams had a brawl inside the Wyatt compound, and this was WWE trying to capitalize on the hype behind cinematic matches, innovated by Brooke and Matt Hardy. However, the match was poorly received by fans, and looking back at it, it wasn't the final deletion, but it was still a pretty good match. I can tell they wanted to do a lot more, and it seemed like they maybe even did, but WWE just kind of over-edited the whole thing, maybe for time, but it just kind of felt all over the place. Their feud concluded in a six-man tag at Battleground in 2016. The match was won by the Wyatts after Woods got freaked out by Bray Wyatt. Now, this was a six-man tag, so the titles weren't on the line. And shortly after that, both teams will be drafted to different brands, thus kind of prematurely ending the feud. The WWE decided to have their first draft in five years in 2016. The New Day got drafted to Raw, where they started a pretty lengthy feud between Gallows and Anderson, and it was mostly centered around Big E's groin injury. A storyline that I found so unfunny that I'm not even going to make any jokes about it. I don't care what hilarious setup you give me. How's Big E's nuts? Oh man, you, <laughs> you just, just say... Nope, not gonna do it. It was during this feud that the New Day passed Paul London and Brian Kendrick's record-breaking tag team championship reign at 331 days. The New Day would lead Team Raw into Survivor Series that year, being eliminated by the Usos. Team Raw still won due to Sheamus and Cesaro, and Sheamus and Cesaro battled each other for weeks in a best of seven series, set up by Raw GM Mick Foley. You remember those days? Right here in Hartford, Connecticut. And the best of seven resulted in them being thrown into a tag team. The New Day had to defend their titles in triple threat tag team matches in back-to-back -back weeks. The first week being against Sheamus and Cesaro and Gallows and Anderson. The next week being against Chris Jericho and Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins and United States Champion Roman Reigns. They managed to successfully regain their titles, beating Demolition's 28-year-old record. However, it was at the pay-per-view roadblock end of the line where the New Day would lose the titles to Sheamus and Cesaro, ending their historic title reign. Looking back on it, it seems crazy, but at the same time, the bar was something that was starting to get over, and the New Day had had the titles for well over a year, so it was time to establish a new team. With the tag team division having numerous depth added to it after NXT call-ups, the New Day's talents were used elsewhere. They went on to host WrestleMania 33, and the following night on Raw, they went against a debuting Revival, where after the match, the Revival ended up attacking the New Day. This led to Kofi Kingston suffering an actual ankle injury. And on April 11, 2017, both SmackDown and Raw's booking was kind of all over the place. They weren't keeping up with the brand split rules. So as part of the superstar shakeup, the New Day was moved to SmackDown. And they didn't appear for a few weeks due to Kofi's ankle injury. But when they did, they came back and faced the Usos. And this rivalry gave us some great moments like the rap battle they had. That's carrying bags for Roman! Just don't get all rated R like your boy Xavier Woods. But it also gave us some really good matches between the two teams. You had their match at Battleground, their match at SummerSlam, they had a Sin City street fight, and my personal favorite, their match in Hell in a Cell. This is, to this day, one of the most underrated Hell in a Cell matches, and I'm glad I get to talk about it and shed a little bit of light on it. I'd give it 5 out of 5 Don Cheadles. This feud brought them all the way to WrestleMania 34 in 2018, with usually a third team being in the mix. However, this time around at WrestleMania, the third team was the Bludgeon Brothers, consisting of Luke Harper and Eric Rowan, a team that I was personally rooting for to do a lot more. Harper and Rowan won the titles at Mania, and dropped them to the New Day shortly after SummerSlam. This began New Day's fifth reign as tag team champion. Welcome 
to the Five Timers Championship Club. Though it was another short-lived title reign, as they ended up losing to Sheamus and Cesaro again just two months later in October on the 1000 episode of SmackDown. The New Day remained relevant in the tag team division for the rest of the year, but in 2019, Mustafa Ali was set to enter the Elimination Chamber match for Daniel Bryan's WWE Championship. He was taken out of the match due to a legitimate injury and replaced by Kofi Kingston. Now, in that match, Kofi had such a showing and got so close to winning the match, and it led to fans almost demanding that Kofi be in a Mania match for the WWE Championship. Throughout Daniel Bryan's initial rise to the WWE Championship, he was often ridiculed for his height and often referred to as a B-plus player. A B-plus. Since then, Daniel Bryan has proved that he is a huge draw and his name holds weight in the company. So fast forward years later and here he is calling Kofi a B-plus player, saying Kofi could never be champion. Because Kofi Kingston is nothing more than a B-plus player. It was similar to Booker T and Triple H's feud, however, it was done much more tastefully. Before Kofi could face Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania, he had to win a gauntlet match, which he actually ended up winning but then Daniel Bryan entered as a surprise final entrant and though he did the best he could he fell short the next week after a standoff with Vince McMahon Xavier Woods and Big E went through a gauntlet match where they faced Gallows and Anderson Shinsuke Nakamura and Rusev The Bar The Usos and Daniel Bryan and Eric Rowan after barely getting through the first three teams the Usos then come out and this is one of those rare moments in the Vince era where long-term storytelling actually comes into play. Everybody knows the Usos fought wars against the New Day. You already earned our respect. Your New Day, good luck, Us, cause we forfeit. The Usos acknowledge the battles that they've been through with the New Day and their respect for Kofi and bows out of the gauntlet match. This leaves just Daniel Bryan and Eric Rowan, which the New Day just barely take care of, meaning Kofi Kingston is going to WrestleMania. So after a pretty good match at WrestleMania versus Daniel Bryan, Kofi Kingston comes out with the WWE Championship, a moment forever deemed as Kofi Mania. And seeing this moment always warms my heart, and in the moment I actually had a tear in my eye. It was such a special moment, not only for the New Day and the fans, but to see Kofi's kids in the ring holding the championship up was such an incredible moment. Kofi went on to defend the title against Randy Orton, Kevin Owens, Samoa Joe, and during his reign, Woods and Big E also picked up the tag team championships, making them six-time tag team champions. And I guess making Kofi a double champion in the process? Someone let me know how that works. Kofi eventually lost the championship to Brock Lesnar, a moment that made us all want to put on our black forces. They lost the tag team titles to the Revival at Clash of the Champions, but then regained it two months later, becoming seven-time world tag team champions. However, the pandemic hit, and for a brief amount of time, WWE was minimizing risk, I use quotes when I say that, by having three tag teams represented by one member in a triple threat match for the tag team championships, which Big E ended up winning, while his other two partners were on Zoom. They then lost the titles two months later to Shinsuke Nakamura and Cesaro, another tag team? They won them back two months later after Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods came back from injury, making them nine-time champions at this point. After the match, the New Day would get some shocking news. Kingston and Woods had been drafted to Raw and Big E had been drafted to SmackDown, thus separating the group but not splitting the group up. It was also the first time all three members of the New Day weren't considered champion since Big E was on a different brand. After arriving on Raw, Kingston and Woods had to exchange titles with the Street Profits in order to keep the titles on their respective brands. WWE actually considers this a title win, so now at this point they are 10-time tag team champion, and the New Day will show up as a trio once more on Survivor Series, promoting their appearance in the Gears 5 game and dressing up as their characters, which I thought was a pretty cool moment, and shortly after they said their goodbyes and went off to their respective brands. And about two months later on December 20th, 2020, they would lose the championships to Cedric Alexander and Sheldon Benjamin. They wouldn't win them again until the March 15th, 2021 episode of Raw. This making them 11-time tag team champions. Big E went on to win the 2021 Money in the Bank ladder match, 
which was pretty shocking but at the same time you don't separate the new day for no reason so they obviously had plans for Big E. And on September 13th, 2021, Big E would cash in his Money in the Bank contract against Bobby Lashley after he just defended against Randy Orton. And I remember being excited for this. I didn't really know where things were going. Certainly, I won't have to put on my Black Forces twice in one video. This also briefly rejoined the New Day as they were all a part of Raw. As part of the 2021 draft, Big E was drafted to Raw, whereas Woods and Kingston was drafted to SmackDown. It was around this time that Woods went on to win the King of the Ring tournament briefly changing his name to King Woods. Big E went on to defend his title against Drew McIntyre, and he also had a triple threat feud with Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins. The entire reign left fans pretty disappointed, especially considering it ended pretty similarly to Kofi's. On January 14, 2022, Kofi Kingston announced that Xavier Woods was injured. Big E was then traded to SmackDown, where they feuded against Sheamus and Ridge Holland. And a match between the four almost led to Big E being paralyzed after Ridge Holland botched an overhead belly-to-belly -belly suplex. About a month later, Big E did an interview where he said it's uncertain if he'll ever wrestle again. And unfortunately, that was the last time we saw him in the ring. And don't get me wrong, the New Day is still good without him. But as a trio, they were literally great. Xavier Woods returned from injury a few months after Big E's injury, and he and Kofi Kingston began appearing on NXT, challenging for the NXT Tag Team Championships and even winning them. This made them the third ever WWE Tag Team Triple Crown Champions, and the first ones to do it in reverse. As part of the 2023 draft, The New Day went to Raw, where they continue to run the tag circuit and still outlast tag teams that they go up against. Honestly, I don't think you can make another tag team like the New Day, even if you tried. And this is just my opinion, but these guys really gave me a reason to watch tag team wrestling in WWE. And I can always guarantee a laugh when watching them. That's pretty much it for this one, guys. Please give a like. And if you're a fan of wrestling or wrestling content, consider subscribing. I cover wrestling in all types of aspects, both in and outside the ring. Put your seatbelt on, and until next time, keep it kaze.